There we go, Dawn. Can you hear us? There we go. Oh, Dawn speaking. Ian's there. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cupper of Life Cafe. I'm Cookie. Uh, we are about to get started, and we've got everyone in the room right now. Again, we've got a couple little gremlins appearing. Um, but what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to share this screen because I want everyone to have a look at this. We we are raising funds for the Australian Sports Foundation as part of this Cupper of Life Cafe. Now, the Australian Sports Foundation recently did a survey and 70,000 community sports clubs were surveyed in this um, survey and 16,000 of them are struggling due to COVID. So what we're doing right now is we're raising money for the Australian Sports Foundation and helping these next level Olympians get through and to make a splash, there we go, I just put a little pull pun into the day, Sim, um, to uh, yeah, continue going. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is if you are, if this is your first time into the Cupper of Life Cafe, please make sure you play nice, be kind, get interactive, ask plenty of questions to Dawn and Ian. Uh, and finally, if there is one thing that we'd love you to do is to share the gold medal moment from today across all your social channels and please do tag us as well. Dawn, can you just give us a thumbs up to hear us? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. And I can hear you too, that's no. perfect. I've You're got on. my grandson's laptop now. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Well, you're on. I'm going to hand over to Kerry. Kerry, over to you. Oh, my gosh. I am so, so, so grateful that we are such great performers under pressure. <laughs> we did it at the Olympics and we're doing it tonight. Um, great to have you guys on. You guys don't need any introduction. Everybody knows who you are, but I'm just going to introduce what the athlete story is all about. And, you know, this docuseries was born out of my desire to fill the void of the Tokyo 2020 Games when I heard it was going to be postponed. And I wanted to harness the wisdom of you guys and all the great, amazing athletic talent that we're bringing on in these 17 days. I wanted to connect Australia and the world with you guys and just really get them inspired at a time that we really, really need it. So we found a cafe. We found a virtual cafe. So thank you so much, Cookie, for having us. And I'm so grateful to, to you, to everyone behind the scenes and all you incredible athletes that we're having on. And the flavour of your cup in this cafe is obviously a massive Olympic flavour. So thank you so much, guys, for joining us. Um, I might start with you, Ian. I might just ask you, if the Tokyo 2020 Games were going to be on, where would you be right now? Would you have been over there? Yeah, I would have been in Japan at this stage. I would have been in Tokyo. Uh, broadcasting for seven um, it would have been you know we'd, we'd be up to the second day of the swimming at this stage um, during Tokyo so completely different circumstances I am at the farm um, just kind of chilling out with some of my friends um, so you know you know going with what's going on in the world at the moment I think you know obviously the right things happened um, that we have postponed the Olympic Games um, and, you know, my hope is that the Olympic Games becomes, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel for a lot of countries. And, you know, I hope it can proceed. Um, you know, there's a lot of athletes that have been uncertain about what they can do in the lead up to this. Um, but I think they've all managed it well and realised, um, you know, the importance of the people that are around them um, as well as their own health um, and the health of the people that they care about. Yeah, absolutely. And our hearts go out to everybody and, you know, wish everyone luck in the next 12 months before they compete in the Tokyo 2021 Olympics. Dawn, what about you? Where would you have been? Would you have been over there? Yes, I would have been at the swimming now watching uh, our Australian swimmers and um, I was getting, I was very excited to um, to have the opportunity of getting it over there, but I'm not so sure about another 12 months. I, I just don't know. It's... Um, it's like, you know, sort of getting back into the water again. Um, what's it going to be? You know? you Sorry? Dawn, I thought you were banned from Japan, aren't you? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not oh, okay. Just checking, just checking. <laughs> <laughs> now, what Ian's talking about is something that, that happened in Japan. We're going to get to that in a sec. But before we get to that, yeah. Dawn, your Olympics, um, your, your career spanned three Olympic Games, so Melbourne in 56, Rome in 60, and Tokyo in 64. Now, Melbourne, home games, young girl, were you really scared or were you excited to be in front of your home crowd? 
No, I wasn't scared. I was really very excited, in fact, over the moon because um, it wasn't, you know, my mum and dad had never seen me swim because they couldn't afford the tickets to go into the swimming pool. And um, I, that was one of the nicest surprises I ever had in my life was that Chief Justice Leslie Heron, who was um, virtually the, the the principal of uh, Australian Swimming Union, and um, he he got behind uh, the people of Belmain who raised money to send my mum and dad down to Melbourne, and he bought them tickets to see me swim in the final of the 100 metres. I didn't even know I was going to make the final, but uh, he had foreseen the future and got tickets for mum and dad, and it was really great for them to see me swim. Now, I'm not sure if you can see those pictures on the screen, Dawn, but I love the outfits back then. Imagine if you had the suits that everyone's wearing now. You would have been way under a minute. For your <laughs> they wouldn't have been as heavy as those suits, believe me. They were the most d disgusting suits that I think I ever wore because they were so loose around the bust area and that the water got down the front and you were carrying extra water in, in the belly, near the belly button. And uh, it was just uh, the swimsuits of today are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's incredible. And you guys didn't wear caps back then either? No, no swimming caps and no goggles. Amazing. Well, yeah. Ian, your, your two Olympics, um, Sydney and Athens, I met you um, at the end of the Sydney Olympics. I remember, I think it was the first time I met you, but I remember sitting on the steps of the Sydney Town Hall. You were, what, 17? And you were so, like, deer in the headlights, like your life was about to just change completely. And I felt really maternal. I wanted, like, to put my arm around you and go, it's going to be okay, you, you know, you're amazing and you're fantastic. How did... Um, yeah, how did that first Olympics really go for you? What was happening up here? What were you thinking and feeling? Um, it's a good question. It's a very, um, it probably requires a long answer. But um, look, it, it, it's odd. Um, I, as a young swimmer growing up, um, you know, I, I, I always felt that I'd be too young to compete at the Sydney Olympics. And then all of a sudden, when I was 15, I became world champion. And then, you know, by the time I was 16, I broke four world records in four days. And so I go into the Olympics as kind of, you know, the unbackable favorite um, going into the games. So it changed entirely um, at, at that point. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it was weird and my life did change you know, from that point on. Um, and I wasn't I wasn't really completely prepared for that. Um, but, you know, as it turns out, and, you know, as I sit here, I, you know, everything has turned out well. Um, and there's been some, some good times and there's been some bad times. Um, but when I reflect back on, you know, my Olympic career, um, you know, most of those times were good. Um, and most of them were, were actually very good. That's great. That's awesome to hear. Now, I want to take you both back to where it all started. I know it's a long time ago, but, Dawn, you were the youngest of eight kids. Yeah. I want to know, how was it that you were the swimmer out of all of the brothers and sisters that happened to create success? Did you get any special treatment from your parents back then or was it just luck? No, I think it was because I was an asthmatic, a really bad asthmatic. My dad was an asthmatic and I was the only one in the family that got it and I've passed it on now to my daughter and my grandson. Uh, but swimming was uh, was something that I was informed that would would take the asthma, would help me with my asthma. And uh, my my first coach was my cousin, Chuck Miranda, and he was down at the Elkington Park Bars, and that's where I learned to swim with my brothers and my family. We used to go down there every weekend and have a family picnic and have a lot of fun around the swimming pool because it was a tidal pool. Um, and then I was seen by Mr Gallagher, who uh, sort of thought I was a very cheeky young grown-up girl, which I was because I was the youngest of... Um, I was a really tomboy and because uh, I was brought up with two brothers that were very close to me in age. And, um, you know, I did everything with them. I played football. I went diving. I water skied. We did sailing. We Dad made us a, a canoe out of the galvanised tin off the roof. And, you know, we just had a lot of fun in, in, in growing up and... Um, and I just think, you know, because I fell in love with it. My first love for sport was uh, horse riding, of course, but uh, we just couldn't afford that. And I did a lot of horse riding down in Adelaide when I went down to live there for Colin Hayes. I, I did all his water work, introduced his, um, his training to his horses to, water, to swim his uh, 
horses after they raced on the Saturday. So I still got my two loves of my sport it was jumping horses and and riding them and, and swimming. And has your grandson got into the horses at all? Have you taken him horse riding? No, as a matter of fact, we were only discussing that yesterday, Dawn around and I, and I said, you know, I think we must take Jackson to get him learn to horse ride because uh, it's a lot of good fun up here in the beaches up in Noosa and uh, I think he would really enjoy that. We can go on long trail rides. Oh, that's a really good rider and, you know, we've, we've had the farm and we've had both been riding horses all our lives. So, yeah, it would be good fun. That's amazing. Look, I, I have a question from a very cheeky friend of mine. Her name is Natalie Cook. I think you both know her quite well. <laughs> She wants to know how the bloody hell do you get up at 5 a.m. every day or 4 or whatever time you do because she, she quit swimming and started playing beach volleyball because she just couldn't get up earlier anymore. What motivates you both? Maybe you can start first dawn, but to get up out of bed that early every single day, like how do you get that commitment? Well, when I went to – I didn't have to – I used to get up about 5, uh, five o'clock when I lived in Sydney. When I went to Adelaide, I used to get up at 3.30 and be in the pool at 4.00. Oh. Of course, um, I was I was working three jobs down in Adelaide at the time, and uh, I had to fit it all into one day. And it was um, it was easy. I think you get used to it. But you know, I really loved Sunday afternoons when I could just lie on my bed and listen to my music. <laughs> I could bet you. I bet you did. Ian, what about you? Do you still get up early? <laughs> no, I don't. Um, <laughs> I choose when I get up now. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I still get up reasonably early. I'm up usually at around 6, six ish like 6 to 6.30. Um, but I was 4.17 um, every morning um, for, you know, like how many years? Six years. Um, because I knew my schedule that that was the amount of time I needed to be able to eat something, be able to drive to training, to be there before quarter to five, um, which was a cutoff point. You had to be there 15 minutes before training to be able to stretch. And everyone thinks it's weird that swimmers get up so early in the morning to train, but there's a lot of reasons for it. We don't only swim in the morning. We also, we do two hours in the morning. We do two hours in the afternoon. We also have other sessions. We have weight work, uh, weight training that we do in the gym. Um, and then we also have other fitness work. We have um, other exercises that we do that prevent injuries. So that's why we have to stretch it out. And also because a lot of us are, are really young, it means that it can fit in with a work timetable or going to school to get your education as well. So that's the reason for all of it. And then everyone freaks out why I say 417. And for anyone that gets up very early in the morning, um, two minutes is a big deal. Um, because if I put it to you this way, two minutes at the end of the week is 14 minutes. At the end of the month, um, you are looking at, uh, at 14, 28, that's 28 minutes at the, the end, 56, then it goes to, so at the end of the year, it's basically eight hours of sleep, which is a whole night's sleep, which we never actually get. But that's my rationale behind the whole thing. Um, but it's also being part of being on a disciplined schedule, um, that you need to have to be able to accomplish something. In I mean, your life too, Kerry, you'd have to be disciplined in, in playing your sport too. You know, you didn't have to get up early in the morning, but you still had to get on the sand and practice because sand was yeah. always changing. It's like, Absolutely. Whether it was raining or wind was, like, blowing a gale or and the sand was kind of going into your eyes, like, we still yeah, exactly. It's that discipline, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. And Kerry, Kerry, what, we didn't have any heated swimming pools, so we we trained early in the morning in Adelaide before the public came into the pool. And, uh, you know, once the pool opened at 7 o'clock, you'd have people. We didn't have private lanes or anything like that. We just had to swim with the public. And, uh, you know, that's not a lot of fun, you know, when you've got people trying to pull you back on your hands and from the, your feet and things like that. But, you know, it, it, it's what uh, Thorpey said. It's a disciplined sport. I wonder if there's a few... Sorry? I was just going to say, what are conditions did you perform in, by the way, Kerry? Sorry, Ian, you go. Yeah, what, what conditions did you prefer performing in? Was it just everything still or anything else? Because I know I used to love training when it was actually raining. Um, mm. That it's something about the water, you know, the rainwater actually trickling down on the surface of the water that actually just made it quite magical and... And, and mystical almost 
that you just go into a trance in what you're doing. Wow, that's really cool. Well, no, rain for us was shocking because the ball would be slippery. We wouldn't be able to handset. <laughs> You know, it would go in your eyes, and especially because when it's raining, it's often cloudy, so you, you didn't need your sunglasses and you'd take them off and the rain, the rain would shoot into your eyeballs. <laughs> Not, nothing mystical about that. <laughs> but I was going to say to Dawn, I wonder if there's some people in Adelaide going, oh, my God, I remember I used to swim next to Dawn in, the, in, you know, in lane whatever, and I beat her. Like back then they used to race against you not knowing who, who you were. But we used how to have a lot of school kids come in at that time in the morning, especially in the afternoon if it was really hot in Adelaide. Sometimes in the summer times it would get up to 113 and it would be very hot. And your pool would be absolutely chock-a-block and you'd have to swim around them. You know, it was uh, a lot of fun, you know, but it was, um, it was good fun. I enjoyed it. Awesome. Well, Dawn, um, sorry, Ian, your parents were pretty sporty. Your dad was a fair cricket player and your mum was an A-grade netballer. You got into swimming. Um, but I just want to know, like, when you had a dream early on to be an Olympian before it happened and you had a dream that you wanted to win a gold medal. When did that kind of eventuate? Was that right at the beginning or was it halfway through? Was it during the Olympics? Like, when did that happen? No, no, well, that's it's not no. Like, so what happened? My sister broke her arm playing uh, netball, and um, the doctor suggested that uh, she should swim to strengthen her wrist. And I went to some swimming carnivals, and at the time, I was playing soccer. I was playing. I was doing little athletics, um, and you know, I I was really bored at these swimming carnivals, um, and. My mum said, look, if you, you do like one training session a week, you can probably swim at these things as well. Um, I went, oh, all right, I'll give it a go. Um, and so I, I, I started swimming and I did it. And I, um, I'm allergic to chlorine um, to start with, um, which, you know, I didn't realize, I, but I, I fell in love with, with, with swimming. Um, and, but when I was training and as I increased my training, I was getting sick. My parents didn't know what it was. So we had um, we had these allergy tests done um, from the doctor. And that was when I found out that I was allergic to chlorine. Um, and the doctor said to my, you know, to my mom at the time, look, if you think he's gonna be a champion swimmer, you know, you can have the adenoids in his nose removed um, and he'll have less problems. And so as it turns out, I still have the adenoids in my nose. Thanks, Mum. Um, <laughs> it was, you know, it wasn't that obvious to start with. So when I started swimming, I used to swim like a water polo player with my nose, my head out of the water because it used to hurt my nose going in. And then I, I started swimming with a nose clip. And then, you know, I started to get good at swimming after that. Um, but, you know, my goal was to be an Olympian. My dream was to become an Olympic champion. Um, and there's a difference between the two things. Um, a goal is a very practical thing that is achievable um, if set the right way and that you discipline yourself to be able to achieve it. Whereas a dream is something that you may feel a little embarrassed to say to someone. It's like saying, I wanna be an astronaut or I wanna be the best neurologist in the world or I wanna be the prime minister of Australia. You know, things that you don't really want to say out loud because you think that you might be just trying to aim a little bit too high. Um, and so my dream was to become an Olympic champion. And when did that dream turn into a goal? When did you know that you actually could do it? Was it, you know, that first time? No, yeah. yeah, good question. So, look, it, yeah, at the World Championships, which happened in 98 when I just turned 15, I... Um, you know, I realized that this is, you know, reality kind of sunk in, oh, wow, this can actually happen quite quickly. Um, but it didn't become the objective that I was looking at. Um, I wasn't pursuing the dream as such. What I was doing in training and everything else was to create the performance or be able to create the training mandate that would allow me to have the best performance to make that outcome most likely. That was what I did. Um, I didn't think, and I used it as motivation. Of course I wanted to be the Olympic champion at the Sydney Olympics, 
but it was me trying to perfect what I could do um, leading into the Olympics that allowed me to be able to achieve that dream at such a, a young age. Yeah, totally. And I totally understand that. You've got to follow, you've got to set your plan and follow the plan and do everything. Dawn, you've won eight Olympic medals for the viewers that, that are not aware of that throughout your um, Olympic career, four gold, four silver. Were any of those um, particularly um, memorable or close to your heart? Which one would be the one that you really kind of value the most? Oh, I think probably I value both. There's two I value and that's uh, Melbourne and Tokyo. Uh, Melbourne was because my mum and dad saw me swim for the first time. I won a gold medal and I was really very proud of that and uh, and also very proud of the people of Balmain who helped mum and dad get down there and also the Chief Justice, uh, Leslie Heron. And Tokyo, of course, because uh, the people of Balmain done the same thing. Uh, they braved up enough money for mum to go to Tokyo and unfortunately she was killed in a car accident in March prior to her going. So... Both of those swims are, uh, that I think about quite a lot is that they are the most important swims in my career. Yeah, amazing. And I know that Tokyo was particularly interesting for a couple of things. I mean, you obviously performed incredibly, but there were a couple of little things from um, Tokyo in 64 that we just want to ask you about. So I know that you, you actually walked in the opening ceremony when you were advised against it. Well, you were at swim. Is what, that right? what happened, uh, Kerry, is the fact that the chef de mission at our meeting said that if anyone was competing within 24 hours of the opening ceremony, you weren't allowed to march. And that was from the chef de mission. So when I went back to my room and I sat down, I worked out I was obviously going to swim about 36, 37 hours after the opening ceremony. So Ooh. I went to my uh, chef and I said to him, uh, look, I'm swimming 36 hours later than the opening ceremony. Can I march? And said, yes, I'll give you permission to march. Now, that's from the boss of the Australian Olympic team. Then Mrs Ross, who was our manageress, she um, she said, Dawn, you haven't got white gloves. You weren't given white gloves in the uh, in your Olympic uniform. I'll take you into Tokyo and we'll get you a pair of gloves so that you, you officially got the official uniform on. So we went into Tokyo and when I got back, uh, I was getting ready to, I had a shower and got dressed in my uniform to get in on the bus. Uh, Bill Slade, who was our manager at the time, said, uh, is anyone on this bus that shouldn't be here? And I said, no, because um, I had permission from the chef de mission. And uh, when I walked, marched in the opening ceremony, which I think every athlete has the right to do to represent their country, because it's one of the most absolutely fantastic things that you can do. And, and the feelings that you get marching out there with your team is just unbelievable. Um, I wore an unofficial swimsuit in the um, in the pool because um, my swimsuit, as I said, was a disgusting make and it filled up with water. Uh, it rode up the back of me and it was very heavy uh, to swim in. I had, I've been a dressmaker myself. I made myself a, a beautiful pair of uh, swimsuit out of silk and it was in green and gold and it had the uh, map of Australia on it, but it wasn't the official one. But we don't forget, we were amateurs in those days. Mm. The Swimming Association was being paid by Speedo for us, to, us team members to wear the swimsuits. So, yeah. that's well, in, in my mind, you did exactly the right thing. As someone who yeah. wants to win the thing, they look after their own equipment. And then I think Ian wanted to ask you something about uh, a flag. <laughs> you know what I am? I'm going to say, like, heads up on the swimsuit thing. This happened again in Sydney 2000 um, for me. Um, you know, I was wearing a non-sponsored, non-branded swimsuit at the Sydney Olympic Games, um, which, you know, again, I was looking at what was the best product that I could wear. Um, and, you know, for me, it was a full body suit. And it's not dissimilar to what Dawn uh, did in, in, in her time um, then, but it was actually being able to wear or have the option to wear the best and recognising that, like a pair of, you know, um, runners um, or, you know, or training shoes, whatever you want to call them, um, that the same thing for a swimsuit. It is performance equipment mm -hmm. and you should be able to select the best um, and that's your individual choice no matter where you are in the world. How much of a difference? I don't think it was much. It wasn't seconds. 
it would have been hundreds of a seconds, if not tens of a second. Um, and that's it. But at an Olympics, that makes a big difference. Yeah. And I wasn't going to settle for second best when I'd done everything that I possibly could. Um, but my question for Dawny is, is around that flag. Um, and I know that you're a little bit cheeky in stealing the flag. Um, and you shouldn't have done that, I think. Um, so I've got two questions around this. Do you still have the flag? And my second is, given that you were so naughty in Tokyo, um, what would your advice be to all of the athletes going into Tokyo um, in the following year? If you want a souvenir, go to the souvenir shop and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Exactly right. And, you know, I, as I, as I was, um, there were three of us that went out to a souvenir flag, right? It wasn't stealing, it was a souveniring flag, and that's what we all, all the athletes want. Right, didn't they steal? Um, um, because no one, owns, no, one owns, no, one owns, no one owns the Australian flag, so I, I will agree with souveniring, by the way. Yeah, and when, when we got caught, went to the police station, um, the detective sergeant said to me, you souvenir, you go shop and buy. And I went, oh. <laughs> this taking flag from the flagpole was stealing. And I went, oh. I said, I'm in big trouble now. He said, yes. And he said, what's your name? And he's Japanese. And I said, it's Dawn Fraser, Australian swimmer. No, no, she would not do this. <laughs> I turned around and said, I think she would. <laughs> and the only reason I got out of it was the fact that I'd fin I was away from the team at the time. I was doing a, a film and we finished shooting on the Friday. And the hockey boys won a bronze medallion. So my uh, producer said to me, Dawn, ring up Charlie and see if you'd like to bring the boys into. The I was staying at the uh, Imperial Palace Hotel, which was down the other end of the from the Imperial Palace. And the boys came in. We had a few drinks. And then I can say who it was now. The doc said to me, come on, Fraser, we'll go and get a souvenir and we'll get a flag. I said, okay, I'll be in it. So there were three of us. I won't mention the other person's name because... He let me down terribly, and I don't wish to, to re, be reminded of his name. But anyway, we got two flags down, and then the whistle started blowing, and we all separated. Uh, they got picked up straight away. I sat in the park for about half an hour or so, uh, and then was walking back to the hotel and got picked up by these policemen. Just got up, and the flag fell out underneath my uh, jacket. Was taken to the police station, went through all this rigmarole, um, um, my producer came down with my ID because we didn't have any IDs on us at the moment. And I said, and also my gold medal's underneath my pillow. We bring that down so I can tell the detective sergeant of the police force. And when he brought it down, he uh, he said, oh, and then they kept on saying, you want a souvenir? Go, go to shop and buy it. So anyway, the next morning I'd hurt my ankle as I jumped down on the fence and um, Doc was strapping my uh, ankle up and uh, knock on my uh, hotel room door and he was this policeman with a big box of flowers and underneath it was uh, the flag from the, the emperor with a big note saying here take the souvenir home <laughs> that's how I got the flag Tony do you still have that do you still have the letter the, the, the note and the flag no I don't have the letter anymore because I think it's been in all my stuff that's packed in a store in, in but my daughter has the flag now because it was put up at an auction and the person that bought it, because she started crying at the at the table, it was a function for me. And uh, uh, the person that bought it gave it to Dawn Rain, and she's got it. Great. Yeah. So it's still in the Fraser household. Good. Can't hear. No, can't hear at the moment. So, that's because uh, that's uh, mate, I'm so professional that I didn't have my microphone on. That's how professional I am. Uh, Ian, I'm, uh, I'm, I've got a question for you. Um, when you're lining up at the blocks, you know, when you're about to take off, what emotions are running through your head? We've got a picture here that I just want to show everyone. But what's what's the emotions that traditionally go through a swimmer's head before they take, take off? Um, you want your mind to be completely... Uh, well, probably void of thought so that you're responsive. Um, if you're thinking about the race, you it's it's done. Um, you can't actually affect that. So you'd be, you know, really process-driven in what you're doing. 
um, and you want to be responsive. You want to be elevated to a heightened sense of awareness of the environment that you're in, um, and you want to be focused in a way. And focus is something when, when, when people say to kids, you need to focus more on what you're doing, mm. well, that's fine. If they're focusing on the wrong thing, they can't possibly be focused on the right thing. So it's being able to focus on what you can do in that situation to get, be able to do your best, to be able to perform in a way that then creates the outcome that you want. If you think about the outcome, um, you're already caught up in your head. Yeah, right. And Dawn, teaching new swimmers, uh, what, what do you teach them as they start to feel those nerves when exactly they jump what, blocks? what Ian's just said, focus on what you've got to do. Mm. If you know, you've done the training, just focus on your lane. Don't worry about the other people in the other lanes. Your lane is your black line. Follow that black line. Do your utmost best. You've got your plan for your race. Stay to your plan. Don't worry about the other swimmers. Yeah, right. Right, totally. Uh, Kerry, nice to see you, with it, mate. Did you go on with this? What's going on? There's a storm outside. I don't know what happened. I just got kicked off, but I'm back. Where are we up to, Luke? Oh, I just, Ian just told us about to run the block. What was that? Go, Ian. What have you got to say? Luke, the only thing I was going to add to it is, look, in a situation like the Olympics or, you know, if someone's going into... Uh, you know, they're, they're finishing off high school and, you know, it is a high pressure situation that you've been preparing yourself for a long time to be able to do. There are going to be butterflies in your, stom in your stomach, so to speak. So what you want to make sure is that those butterflies are flying in unison in your stomach rather than clashing against each other. Um, and so that's a process of working out, you know, the way that you actually communicate um, to yourself you know, between your subconscious and your unconscious mind. Totally. Over to you, Kerry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> hey, Ian, we want to just celebrate your Olympic achievements too because we haven't really talked about them. You've only won nine Olympic medals, um, you know, never mind. <laughs> Five gold, Sorry. three silver and a bronze. Which one was your most memorable? Um, it's really hard. It's like... um. You know how everyone has a favourite child? I don't have children, but um, you know how people pretend they, have, they don't have favourite children? Um, you know, it, it's the same thing. Um, for me, I, you know, each one means something different. My first um, was really important to me because I realised what I, I'd been able to do to be able to accomplish that. But then I guess the hype around the 4 by 100 freestyle, it's... He's having troubles there by the sounds of it, Kerry. He might have just moved to Dawn for a second. Okay. All right, cool. I thought that was me. Um, Dawn, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> yeah, I can. Oh, it's really, the gremlins are really in from the weather tonight. They're giving us a hard time, but we'll, we'll keep going. Um, Dawn, I know you've had some challenging times and you mentioned you mentioned that your mum passed away just before the 64 games and, you know, obviously you went through a lot during that time and you still came out on top. Can you tell us and give us some examples about how people with, you know, things going on in their life, especially now in these times, how they can deal with um, great tragedies and still come out on top because that's exactly what you did. I think he, he, Ian has said it all is to stay focused on your job and what you've got to do. And I know you, we've got another 12 months down the line with our athletes and they've got to now fo refocus on what they had for this week. They should have been there in Tokyo competing, but now they've got to put the focus on to another 12 months. And everyone can do it if they do it the right way. It's just say, right, okay, I've got 12 months to go to the, uh, to the Olympic Games. Those that have been chosen that have qualified, they, they're right, but it's the ones that now have to re-qualify. It's going to be difficult for them, but if they stay focused on the job that they want, they've got in front of them, they'll get there. 
Yeah, absolutely. And we all know that what you focus on grows. Mm. Uh, so whether you're focusing on the negative or the positive, that's what's going to come out for you. Now, look, you've been involved in the games ever since you retired. You know, pretty much you've had different experiences. You've hosted, commentated, you've you've been with sponsors, you've been mentoring. Um, I'm not sure if you've actually done any coaching, but what keeps you coming back every four years and getting involved with this wonderful, I mean, I know it's just an amazing culture, but what keeps you coming back? I just love it. I just love uh, mentoring the kids. I, I just love sitting and talking to them and asking what they want out of their sport. Um, I've had a great couple of last, or the last five years I've been with the mentoring of the Paralympian swimmers and, and also our up and coming uh, swimmers. And it's just brought uh, it's just brought me back into the sport again, even even though I didn't leave, leave it like that. But um, I, I just um, I just really love being with you. I love going watching them compete, uh, what they want to achieve in their life, and and a lot of them come up and say, you know, is it really as good as it it looks? And I say, yeah, it's it's really bloody fantastic, and, <laughs> and it makes them want to. Do it. And, you know, with this Kobaya stuff that we've had. It was, you know, the swimming pools were closed. I was sorry to see them closed. I wish they had been kept open for the swimmers because chlorine does affect the uh, coronavirus. It, it, it sort of keeps it a, a nice level. Uh, but all of the kids were really so g glad to say, oh, I can't wait to get back in the water and I'm so glad I'm back. And to me, that's a very positive thinking person. Yeah, it's good. It's good for everyone, all the sports people, to get back in. Unfortunately, Melbourne shut down again, and they're going to yep. be going through that whole drama all over again. So let's, you know, wish them lots of luck and hope that it doesn't, you know, continue on around the country. Um, Dawn, one of your, uh, one, you said how much you love it, and I think this was probably a pretty special moment for you. But the Sydney Olympic Games, carrying the torch. Yep. Um, to to Kathy with those other incredible women, um, Betty Cuthbert, Raylene Boyle, Shirley Strickland, uh, Della Hunty, Shane Gould and Debbie Flintoff King, all of you together took that flame around the stadium. I was there, I was watching, and then you gave it on to Kathy and it was just such a magical moment. Tell us how you felt. Were you nervous? Oh, no, I didn't care. I wasn't nervous. I was excited, I think. Um, yeah, excitement would, would be the word because, um, and I was extremely proud that they were all women carrying mm. the flame around the uh, around the arena. And it's the first time in the history of the Olympic Games that all women uh, took the torch around because it's always been a mixture. And it was great to see Cathy light the flame. The first, uh, the first that... woman in the modern Olympic Games to light the flame. And I think it said a, a lot for Australia. I think yeah. they were one of the best games, the 2000 games. And I think they're on Channel 7. They're showing, replaying it next uh, Tuesday night, I think, if, if I'm correct. Yeah, I think it's. I think it might be Wednesday, but we're definitely going to be letting everybody know. You'll hear about yeah. it. Channel 7 have got an opening ceremony special. You'll feature throughout that. And then I think a few days later they're doing a, a special moment, you know, all sorts of different moments from the Sydney Games. And I might pop, I might pop it up in that one with Nat, I think. I, I think you do, actually. <laughs> but I, I remember the Sydney Games. You were an attaché with the Games, or like a mentor for the athletes. And we, we remember you distinctly at the beach volleyball, um, yourself and Dawn Lorraine, and, and you were leading the cheer squad. I mean, I've got a cool. video of you where it's, I think we were having a timeout and the guy on the mic, you know, so much music and everything going on, he came up to you and you leant over the, over the fence and you did the big walk right, Aussie, 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 and everyone just went off, oi, oi, oi. Do you remember that? I certainly do because um, it, that that, that uh, war cry, as I called it, we first, Laurie Lawrence and I first got did that, oh, years ago, and it's always been one that's, uh, one that's good. And, and, you know, people get really involved with it, which is fantastic. Yeah, it was fantastic. Welcome back, Ian. <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear us okay? Can I hear? Yeah, yeah, we can hear. I can hear. Yeah, all good, all good. Um, Ian, I want to talk to you a little bit about when you retired. I know you um, retired a couple of times, like most of us. I did that as well. How, the first time you retired, how, why was that? What What was going on? Well, I guess the context of what I was doing completely changed. I went from being someone who was an athlete that, you know, what they loved doing was training, swimming, and then, you know, and, and competing in that sport. But the context of what I did became completely different. 
Um, it was then, you know, doing press conferences and things like that, which I had never expected. There was a tremendous amount of, you know, pressure, which was, was fine. I expected that, you know, when I was competing, but, you know, I didn't realize that, um, you know, a swimmer would have paparazzi following them and things like that. And so for me, I felt that my, my, I'd lost myself a little bit in all of that. Um, so that was why I retired the, the first time. Um, but then, you know, for some reason, I, you know, I wanted to really find my love of why I started swimming um, and what it was about it as a young boy at that stage um, of why I wanted, why I swam. What was it about this that, you know, really uh, took me to the places uh, that it did? And I was able to refine that. Um, and I'm appreciative of that because now my perspective on the sport is different. I, I look at it with that same lens that I would have had as a young man um, rather than the one where, you know, it had changed in front of my eyes. Yeah, two very different experiences. Okay, guys, so this has been so good. Before you go, because I know you have to go shortly, In we do this 60-second sprint where I'm just going to rapid fire ask you a couple of questions. I'll do it with you, Ian, first. If you want to do it after dawn, you can say yes or no if you don't. Um, but definitely do it with you to start with, Ian. So are you ready? Ladies first. Ladies first. Ladies first. Oh, do you want to do it first? Dawn? I want to hear Thorpey. <laughs> okay, we can go. The we'll, clock stops. We'll go for equality then. We'll Sorry. go for equality then. We'll go for equality. So that's all right. Dawn's called me out. I'll go. Okay. All right. We'll start the clock. Okay. Who do you think would win the men's 100 metre freestyle today if it was on? No idea because of COVID. Ah, good question, good answer. How much do you think might change in the next 12 months? Um, significantly. Um, circumstances and the ability to be able to adapt is the most important thing. How much do you, uh, sorry, which famous person would you most like to meet that you haven't already? I'm sure you've met a lot, but anybody still? Uh, Malala Yusuf. Oh. How, have you run with the torch? And if so, when? I had before the Beijing Olympic Games. I didn't do it in Sydney. We were worried. I broke my ankle less than 12 months out from the game, so they didn't want me running. Okay. Have you ever asked for anyone else's autograph? When I was a kid, yes, I did. Who? I think I even had <laughs> Do you still have, last question, do you still have many of your Olympic outfits or are they all gone? Yeah, they're in storage, but I have them. I kept them. Uh, you must have boxes and boxes and <laughs> They give you yeah. a lot. Of awesome. You did well. Tick. <laughs> Are you ready, Dawn? Yes, okay. Okay. We'll set the timer. <laughs> Dawn, are your medals worn out from sticky hands or do you keep them tucked away? No, anyone touches my medals, they have to have a pair of gloves on. Beautiful. What was the first thing you said when you'd realised you'd won your first gold medal? What came out of your mouth? Um, I, I couldn't. The, the starter came up to me and said, your mum and dad's sitting in the stand. Go up and see them. I went, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever lost your cosy or your swimsuit in the pool? No. How many pairs of goggles would you have gone through in your lifetime? Uh, well, we didn't wear goggles, and it wasn't only until I got a bit older that I've, uh, after I retired, goggles came in. Oh, maybe we should ask Ian that in a sec. Um, your worst Olympic moment? Um, I don't think I've got one. Oh, I, I think I'd, I'd have to say souvenirring the flag, but it was called stealing. <laughs> um, if you hadn't become an athlete, what do you think you would have done? Would a horse ride. The question. And then finally, your craziest Olympic moment, besides the flag, another crazy moment. Um, I don't think I've got one because um, when I, I stopped swimming, I then mentored and I had the opportunity of mentoring with Thorpey, which was great. Pretty crazy, yeah. <laughs> but great. <laughs> hey, Thorpey, how many goggles do you reckon you've gone through? 
Um, I've gone through more goggles than I have um, swimsuits. So swimsuits, we like to be baggy and everything else, you just trade in them until they fall apart. But I do have this weird thing that I actually prefer to perform in blue goggles um, rather than any other color, um, which changed at the Athens Olympics where they're actually, um, they were mirrored um, because I, the sun would have been setting where I was turning my head to breathe. I remember that. They were pretty cool goggles. Do you still have any goggles at all? I mean, obviously you might swim every now and again, I'm not sure, but do you still have many goggles? Not really. I, I'd <laughs> actually have to go searching for them. <laughs> I've got old school like Dawn. No goggles, you know what, you know, swimsuit, water can go down the front, it's all good. <laughs> awesome. Well, we might take for the last couple of minutes, if you can hang with us still, Ian, um, a couple of questions from some of our viewers. Cookie's going to come on and ask those. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm back. Um, I've got a question for Ian from Rob. Can you tell us what a typical day of rest, eating and training looked like on a day when you were um, your Olympic final was in the evening? Oh yeah, so usually it would be it would be a, a, a heat um, in the morning. Um, sometimes it would have been a semi final the night before, um, but it would have been so if it's a heat and then a final. So the four hundred freestyle first day, um, it you know I would have I would have swum the heat, I would have qualified for the final, and then I would have swum down. So after that, so I prepared for the heat um, a couple of kilometers, then I, I'd swum the race, then after it I then do recovery, which is, you know, also, a, 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 you know, 1,500 to two kilometres of swimming down. Um, then I'd, I'd get a massage, I'd start eating, um, then I'd get back to the village, I'd have something to eat. I'd then go and try and get a rest, um, if not a sleep. The sleep, if it was a sleep, was limited, that it would be around 40 minutes. Then I'd, um, you know, still try and relax, uh, come back for the final. Um, swim the final, if I've only got one event that night, you know, then, you know, repeat what I did the next day. But then on top of that, there, there usually, which is a good thing, there's a medal ceremony. Um, and also, you know, we have to do anti-doping, we have to do press. Um, yeah. So we're always thinking, the, the issue is we're always thinking of what is next rather than being in that exact moment at that time, um, especially if you're preparing for another event that night, if not another event. The next day mate well um b's asked for you dawn any tips for young swimmers 13 years of age aspiring to follow her idols and go to the olympics just concentrate on what they're going to do do what the coach is telling them to do do all their training and, and really enjoy it that's the most important word i can use with any athletes that I, I i talk to and i think i carry i've told you to enjoy it and i've told you to enjoy what you do it's a very important word Totally. Um, question for you both uh, from Jill. Uh, do you both feel the pressure to represent Australia in probably our most popular sport at the Olympics? I know all athletes would feel some sort of pressure, but because it's almost a national sport, which we it is, do you think that added pre that there's any additional pressure for the swimmers? Uh, I can say that it helped me because, uh, you know, I, competing in Melbourne at my first Olympics and coming from Belmain, a Labor Party, a Labor uh, family it, it was most exciting time for me and you know i just sort of didn't think it was any pressure at all it did get a lot of pressure in, during tokyo but uh i, I was sort of experienced enough then to carry it through and, and carry on with it what about you Anne? yeah look there is i i believe there is added pressure for high profile athletes and given that swimming is um probably the most profiled sport uh for australians at the Olympic Games, there is an additional layer of pressure that comes with that. Um, but you get to determine how you respond to that. You know, leading into the Sydney Olympics, I didn't have the perfect preparation, um, but I was able to manage it well. Um, whereas at the Athens Olympics, it's not a home games. I had a different kind of pressure on me at those games as being a defending Olympic champion, which I'm sure Dawn can relate to as well um that it, it it does change um so i mean the best thing would be that you know no one knows about what we do and we just swim and get on with it um, but it also isn't very exciting that way so you know why should we do that and it's all about perspective 
Um, you can even think of, you can think of it as a nation being behind you, pushing you on, spurring you on, or you can think of it as a nation on your back weighing you down. You yeah. get to make that decision. Mental decision, right? Um, Corrine's asked uh, for you, Dawn, do you think the mental pressure on athletes is the same now as to when you were competing? I think it's a bit more experienced now because, you know, we've got uh, we've got other sides of a sport now that we didn't have years ago. And, just mm. have, you know, I, I like to think that I was a pioneer in getting rid of the amateur status because that was a holdback for a lot of swimmers, especially me. You know, if I had to do a television show, I had to make an invoice out and show it to the Australian Swimming Union that I, I took 20 pounds for that interview. And I had to itemise everything I... I my stockings, my makeup, my clothes, and stuff like that. And today, the kids don't have to do that, which is fantastic. Mm. And they're getting paid some uh, good money if they win a gold medal. I think you know, it's all changed, and I think you know it's fantastic the way it is now. Totally. And last question for you: When did you think you could win the four by one hundred during the race? Did you just know that you had it, or was it just no, it was <laughs> not at all? <laughs> like uh, no. Um, Look, behind that inspired team, we believed that we could. We didn't know how, but we believed that we could. Um, and I knew that with 15 metres to go, um, that it was, you know, I had a shot. And I knew that my competitor, Gary Hall Jr., he was going to be hurting a whole lot more than what I was, mm. and I reminded myself of that. Good answer, good answer. Um, back to you, Kerry, that's it for the room. Oh, awesome. Look, guys, I always want to thank you so much. I love you both so much. You've been incredible, um, like, mentors to me. You're inspirational, and it's been such a pleasure to get to know you more today as I was researching your lives, but also chatting with you tonight. I want to thank Luke for having us in the Couple Life Cafe, and I also want to thank um, Nikki and um, Jill and everybody behind the scenes, so much that goes into this and all the gremlins that were with us tonight. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> and I want to leave you with some positivity. I want to say that the only time you fail is when you fall down and you don't get up. Yes, very true. Very true, very true. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, before we head off, please do make a donation for the Australian Sports Foundation. Uh, obviously, we're doing this free of charge and all the talent are coming on to inspire the nation. But without junior clubs, um, the next level athletes may not get through. And about 16,000 clubs are in trouble right now due to COVID. Uh, so we want to make sure that every dollar counts. So I've just put that back into the office area right now. Please do make sure you make that donation. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us once again. And we're going to say goodbye, everyone. Give a final wave, Ian, Dawn, Kerry, and we'll catch you all soon. See you later, everyone. Bye. Yeah, love you all. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, bye.